Hello, this is Tony Hiller from RealClimateScience.com, the climate guy setting the record straight about climate. In this video, I show how climate science peer review is complete garbage. A new study published in the prestigious journal Nature Climate Change says that the frequency of hot days is going to skyrocket by the end of the century. The author says the United States is going to be an oven. That sounds bad. We're all going to burn up. Let's look at the actual data. The author claimed that the frequency of killer hot days is going to skyrocket over the next 80 years. The author doesn't say what she means by killer heat, so let's look at several different temperature ranges. We'll start with 90 degree days. This graph shows the average percent of days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit at all United States Historical Climatology Network stations. This is the best network of temperature stations in the world, containing about 1,200 thermometers scattered fairly evenly around the United States. What this graph shows is that the frequency of 90 degree days peaked in the 1930s and has dropped rather sharply since then. And in fact, since 1960, 90 degree days have become relatively rare in the United States compared to how often they occurred prior to 1960. Well, perhaps the author didn't consider 90 degree temperatures to be killer heat. Maybe she meant 95 degree temperatures. This graph plots out the same thing as the previous graph, except now it's for 95 degree temperatures instead of 90 degree temperatures. Once again, we see the same pattern. The frequency of 95 degree days has plummeted in the U.S., and they peaked in the 1930s and 1950s. They've been relatively rare since 1960. Maybe the author didn't consider 95 degree temperatures to be killer heat. Maybe she meant 100 degree heat. This graph shows the same thing as the previous two plots, except for 100 degree temperatures. Again, we see the same pattern. 100 degree temperatures peaked in the 1930s, huge peak in 1936, another peak in the 1950s, but they've been plummeting since then, and since 1960 we've had very few 100 degree days in the United States. Let's look at one more graph, 105 degree temperatures. Perhaps that's what the author meant by killer heat. Once again, we see the same pattern. The frequency of 105 degree days has declined in the United States. A huge peak in 1936 and 1934, another peak in 1954, and another peak in 1980. But generally, we've had very few 105 degree temperatures in the United States since 1960. There's zero evidence backing the author's claims. So how did it make it into a prestigious journal? How did it get past peer review? This is junk science. The answer is simple. In order to get past peer review in climate science, all you have to do is generate a conclusion which supports global warming theory. It doesn't matter whether any of your data is factual or not. The global warming research business is a multi-billion dollar industry. Many scientists depend on this government funding for a living. In order to keep this funding coming in, climate scientists have to maintain a level of alarm. Congress will only fund climate scientists if there's a perceived problem. Let's picture what would happen if climate scientists came out with a study saying that heat waves were getting less severe in the U.S. Congress would say, well, there's no problem there. We're not going to spend money researching that. Like everybody else, climate scientists have bills to pay. Some of them may have families. They have to keep the funding coming in. They have a huge conflict of interest. They have to keep global warming alarm alive. Let's look at what happens to climate scientists who have the integrity to tell the truth about global warming. One year ago, my good friend Dr. Bill Gray from Colorado State University passed away. Bill was the top tropical meteorologist in the world. He was the guy who invented hurricane forecasting. Bill received funding for his research every year from the 1960s until 1993. But something changed in 1993. 
Al Gore became vice president. Gore invited Bill to a global warming meeting he was holding. Bill said he would be happy to attend, but he didn't have a lot of confidence in Gore's theories. Bill's government funding got cut off immediately after that. He never got another penny out of the government. The top tropical meteorologist and hurricane forecaster in the world couldn't get any money out of the government because he refused to go along with Gore's global warming scam. Everyone in the global warming business understands this. If you go along with the scam and toe the line, you get funding, you get a claim, you get published in journals, you get trips to exotic places for conferences. Life is good for people who go along. I would frequently walk down the hallways with Bill at the Atmospheric Sciences Department at Colorado State University. Many of his colleagues wouldn't talk to him or even look at him. He threatened their funding by telling the truth. And recently, Democratic politicians like Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island have stepped up their attacks on scientists who tell the truth, threatening them with prosecution. The purpose of climate science peer review is to protect the global warming scam and thus keep funding coming in. The people involved have a huge conflict of interest. The American author Upton Sinclair wrote, It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science for a long time.